As you know, most of the corporations, uh, at least the big ones like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Apple, are trying to portray themselves as moving towards sustainability, net zero, renewable energy, all these good things. And financial institutions are being asked by the Federal Reserve in the U.S. <coughs> and the European agencies to calculate their risks, the loans they are making, the default rates and so on. But we don't have a very good framework to convert global climate into local risks necessarily. You can do you know, many of the downscalings that uh, are useful for applications for irrigation advisories, health, energy and so on, but you cannot downscale risk as such. So risk is very local, it's very sector specific, depends on the hazard, vulnerability, exposure and now also response. So this is a nice little perspective. It's fairly short, but I'm going to be brief anyways. Science-based principles for corporate climate transition risk quantification. How do we translate climate change information and projections into risk quantification for climate transition that corporations have to undergo now and what are the science principles behind them. Currently no comprehensive scientific methodology of corporate risk quantification in response to new disclosure regulations has been proposed in the literature. So regulations are basically telling corporations to quantify the risks they are taking uh, with climate change. Could be raw materials they are relying on which comes from somewhere else, energy sources, whatever else. Uh, <clears throat> here we develop fundamental principles that are important for the appropriate use of climate scenario science in transition risk assessments. We have discussed in detail the climate scenarios where we went from, uh, you know, early on they were called special uh, reports on emission scenario, then they became assessment reports with representative concentration pathways, now they are shared socio-economic pathways and, you know, take many things into account through integrated assessment models, then the emissions are fed into the Earth system models and sometimes there is an iteration and so on. Climate disclosures have become increasingly widely adopted by companies since the inception of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD. While the TCFD was voluntary framework developed by the financial institutions to bring some transparency and standardization to climate risk disclosures, regulatory developments have started adopting the fundamental framework developed by the TCFD for climate risk disclosures. There is the network for greening the finance system which has also done some translations which uh, the financial institutions are considering. Uh, not corporations. So I have uh, podcasts on that elsewhere. So here, however, both the TCFD and the derivative regulations do not provide detailed guidance on the scientific methodology to be adopted for estimation of quantitative financial impact from physical uh, and transition risks identified. What are the risks of the extreme events let's themselves or often we think of them as chronic changes, temperature changing in the background for example, and acute stressors like heavy rainfall, cyclones, whatever. This has left a gap between the science and practice required by law in many cases of climate risk estimation and disclosure at the corporate level. While higher level frameworks have been proposed in the literature, particularly for the financial sector and institutions such as the United Nations Environmental uh, Environment Program Finance Initiative the Network for Greening Financial Systems that I mentioned and the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero have developed high level guidelines for investors, specific methodology for methodologies for companies have not been standardized. So some high level instructions are, or frameworks are given but what a specific company can do is not so obvious. This gap has generally been filled by environmental social governance disclosure practitioners so called ESG by developing customized methodologies for downscaling physical risks to the asset level and transition risks down to the corporate level from the sectoral projections from peer reviewed and published climate scenarios. In many cases these physical and transition risk assessment uh, 
uh, sorry, these transition risk assessment methodologies are proprietary and are not scientifically peer-reviewed or trans, uh, transparently disclosed. So these are compliance requirements and corporations will do something. It doesn't mean they will share the details on how they did it with everybody. So maybe the uh, regulators will see what they did, but the rest of us don't know. And there is no way to peer through them and do peer review, right? Even as many providers continue to provide physical risk estimates based on climate change scenario projections, transition risk quantification continues to have a lack of standardization and transparency across methodologies, often making comparisons difficult. So here they propose some fundamental principles for consideration related to corporate climate transition risk quantification that are science-based and can help reduce potentially comparable risk assessment results. Okay, so you have global thing, you know, global uh, scale that mitigation uh, requires and then very, very hyper local scales at which adaptation happens. So mitigation is of course reducing our impact on climate and CO2 emitted everywhere is going to get mixed and last for centuries. So we can do mitigation at uh, look, ha, global scales, global leadership has emerged whereas adaptation is very local, sector specific, location specific and so on. So here are the principles they identify, the rationale, the considerations for each uh, which are given in the paper subsequently. Transition risks typically encompass more than just carbon emissions accounting. Many transition risk methodologies that have been developed such as temperature rating or net zero target based methodologies depend entirely and exclusively on carbon emissions as a measure of a corporation's transition risk. There is always a t tunnel view on carbon and often societal factors like equity, justice or ESG are not considered and here they are talking about the carbon approach focus on carbon alone, not meeting the requirements for corporate risks, right? This is not always comprehensive either. The TCFD calls for comprehensive disclosure of all transition risks. Transition risks arise from the transition of the energy system in line with the mitigation scenario, so moving towards renewables. And depending on the scenario, the transition risks can be those that are dependent on the overall carbon emissions of a company and then those that are independent of the carbon emissions okay so risks dependent on risks dependent on carbon emissions include carbon taxation of factors that drive economic structural change or for example subsidies for low carbon products that can benefit competitors within the same sector and risks 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 not dependent on carbon emissions can include for example changes in market conditions due to climate related migration supply chain disruption due to climate related conflicts and other second order impacts these impacts cannot be mitigated using emissions reduction and may in fact represent a substantial portion of the overall climate transition risk okay so those are the kind of details. The elements also include cost abatement, centrality of to economic processes, availability of alternative methodology, and so on. That we'll see in a, a table very soon. Holistic discussion of risk rather than just carbon-related risks gives investors a clearer picture of the exposure. Second principle, at least two widely comparable scenarios should be used for one risk disclosure statement. So risk is uh, displayed, but it's based on various what if scenarios for the future. Scenarios are typically taken from widely uh, used scenario frameworks, including the shared socioeconomic pathways that I mentioned. I have podcasts on this, this you can follow up with. Network for greening the financial system scenarios, which translates the physical variables like temperature, rainfall, cyclones into financial risks uh, or international energy agency scenarios. For com uh, comparability, the, scena the scenarios should be from the same framework that is NGFS scenarios should compare against only other NGFS scenarios. So hot house world against disorderly or orderly transitions. So typically the three scenarios are selected, one for business as usual, 
now frequently termed as current policies, one for insufficient or and or delayed climate action, and a third to demonstrate aggressive climate action. So as you go into the future, you say we'll do nothing or we'll do aggressively something or we will worry about lots of things and basically put climate action on the back burner, which happens when the pandemics come or the, when wars break out and so on. So risks are often then expressed for each of the scenarios separately. So that can be uh, problematic. So one has to serve, you know, risks have to serve the baseline risk and at least another scenario to serve as the potential future for which risk is being disclosed. So baseline scenario is typically where we do nothing and everything continues as is with fossil fuel based uh, growth and uh, policies that are not so friendly to climate action and so on. So <coughs> there are a variety of scenarios for 1.5 uh, degrees centigrade global warming target by 2100 with 67 per, uh, percent probability and so on. Comparative risk disclosures can tell the investors explicitly the specific trends or outcomes against which the risk is being estimated. If you skip that detail, then we don't know who is doing what, right? So to the extent that there are compliance requirements, if each corporation submits something that are not consistent with each other, then imp, uh, you know enforcement becomes very tricky about meeting the compliance or not. Thirdly, there should be transparency around which transition risks are assessed quantitatively and qualitatively and which ones are excluded. Transition risks are whole system risks dependent on socioeconomic conditions, market trends and behavioral changes among other complex factors. For this reason, not all transition risks can be quantified. Okay. So there are many exclusions often made, but the exclusion should be clearly documented qualitatively to eliminate a false sense of confidence in the transition risk quantification and to better inform investor decision making. So corporations which depend on shareholders and investors are doing something and if the investors and shareholders don't know the risks, then they are obviously taking huge risks. So this is why this is needed. So the third level, uh, the third principle then is about transparency. And fourthly, lack of extreme events coverage should be acknowledged in disclosures. If you are computing risks and in a location where you are operating or locations on which you, your supply chain depends, you are not considering extreme events, then you are obviously not covering you the risk space completely. Scenarios are typically based on long-term projection models, typically optimized, that often don't take into account stochasticity such as extreme events or shocks, climate related or not. Yet, one of the primary pathways through which climate change is impacting the economy is through the emergence of unpredictable extreme events and 23-24 has been a classic example of how the global warming got superimposed with the El Nino and maybe a uh, underwater volcano from before and we got a warming that's much more than we expected and there is a complete smorgasbord of uh, extremes events across the planet so doesn't discriminate against rich and poor countries everybody got hammered and it still continues as of now in October 2024 so Transparency in exclusions such as extreme events can tell investors the limits of risk quantification and what they should be aware of beyond quantitative disclosures. Just because you got a risk map that looks very systematically computed and they don't tell you exactly what was excluded, then you are still taking a risk. Risk model assumptions at the fifth uh, scientific principle. Risk model assumptions should not differ from underlying climate scenario assumptions. What the future is, is based on lots of details in climate scenarios about renewables, bioenergy, uh, policies, and whether there will be regional conflicts, whether it will be business as usual or will head towards sustainability, population growth, and so on and so forth. All those assumptions should be consistent with translating the climate risks into corporate transition risks as well. So climate scenarios have underlying narratives and assumptions about the socio-economic transition that are specific, quantitative and detailed. Quantitative models of corporate value at risk also have uh, underlying assumptions that 
assumptions sorry about various economic variables related to the business such as cost of production market share and market adoption of uh, low carbon products so there is always a compliance requirement where corporations may just do the bare minimum to meet the compliance and then there are shareholders and investors who need a real picture of the risks right so risk drivers from climate models should be accounted for in evaluation of other risk drivers carbon costs for instance should be treated as the same way as other costs are treated in accounting so it, beyond compliance if carbon tax comes down from governments then how are you going to include that in your cost benefit analysis and the risks and so on and so forth okay so ultimately it should be acknowledged that quantification of climate transition risks risks continues to be i have trouble saying risks continues to be as much an of an art as a science with many scientifically unsettled questions still to be addressed any disclosure of climate transition risks should take this uncertainty into account and should not use the disclosures of understate should not use the disclosures to understate the risks on the flip side first movers in assessing climate transition risks may discover opportunities before others so early adopters first ones who are very open transparent and uh, active or not active very detailed about computing risks may actually end up benefiting before others begin to realize that there are benefits to doing this and estimating those can allow companies to plan and strategically realistically sorry and strategize realistically in a rapidly evolving climate and regulatory environment in other words instead of doing this just for compliance if they start to realize that this is actually going to uh, improve the bottom line and protect their own uh, profit over time then they may do it better like esg for example many companies found out that that actually improves employee well-being productivity profits and so on okay so table 1 illustrative examples of application uh, of principles i won't read all the uh, examples here transition risks typically encompass more than just carbon emission accounting so imagine an electric electric utility that is Uh, actively monitoring their carbon emissions and reporting if they set a target to become net zero by 2035 then according to temperature rating or carbon based metrics their climate transition risks will be low so they are already ahead by for the 2050 transition at least two widely comparable scenarios should be used for one risk disclosure statement as we said in the second principle there should be transparency around which transition risks are assessed quantitatively and qualitatively and what is excluded from the calculations so a heating and cooling equipment manufacturer for example can make a risk statement that under an insufficient climate action scenario with rising temperatures they expect sales to grow more than the current policies in the global south however such a statement may not take into account the risks associated with the overall economic damages in the global south under insufficient climate action reducing the market of, for cooling products to present a holistic picture it is important to describe which risks are included uh, and which risks are excluded in the analysis fourth one lack of extreme events coverage should be acknowledged in the disclosures thermal power plant example is given here risk model assumptions should not differ from underlying climate scenario assumptions as we said so market share may not be compliant with many 1.5 degree c scenarios which may be used for computing risks such scenarios assume an economy wide transition to zero or low emission vehicles in this case the risk estimate would probably be inaccurate so if you are just assuming that the world is heading towards 1.5 degree compliance which obviously is not going to happen because we are already pretty damn close to it even though we might come back down after 23 24 so that's something to worry about finally assumptions that must be aligned with aligned between climate scenarios and climate risk models so climate scenario assumptions and risk model assumptions starting from 
Underlying socioeconomic drivers and assumptions, climate scenarios such as shared socioeconomic pathways are driven by projections of population and gross domestic product which have underlying assumptions on growth rates, fertility and education. Company revenue and other projections should be aware of the socioeconomic projections in the climate scenarios selected. Specific company projections can differ from sectoral projections, but deviations need to be justified and be transparently mentioned. Change in production and use of energy carriers. Climate scenario scenarios result in different outcomes for the production and use of energy carriers such as electricity, hydrogen, heat and liquid fuels, as well as how they are sourced, renewable or bioenergy and so on. Well, bioenergy is not totally renewable unless you are really, really uh, making sure no carbon is emitted. Under high mitigation scenarios, for instance, unabated fossil fuel carriers are largely phased out, phased out by 2050. Uh, companies, on the other hand, operations and products that require energy carriers and business plans should be consistent with the demand and availability within the climate scenario that's given by them. For example, a company that manufactures combustion engines must assume widespread availability of clean e-fuels in mitigation scenarios where fossil fuels are largely phased out. Finally, sectoral and regional distribution of carbon emissions. Climate scenario assumptions are linked to specific carbon emissions projections for the world and different sectors and regions. Ambitious 1.5 degree C scenarios, for instance, project global CO2 emissions reaching net zero in the 2050s, but sectoral and regional timings differ. Globally, we are doing one thing, but sectorally and regionally, they add up to different, they come down to different things. For corporations, company emissions projections, including value chain emissions, need uh, to align with the broader sectoral change of the climate scenario selected, taking into account differentiated sectoral and regional distributions and timing as well as implications for changes in emissions scopes. So you have scope 1, scope 2, scope 3 as well as just what are the choices you are making that determine your emissions in each step let's say. So obviously uh, these are still broad principles and they are very useful that they have to be still translated to sector specific corporations and their dependencies on their raw materials, energy and so on. So you can also look up the financial risks uh, that have been computed uh, for help or for uh, regulating the financial institutions in the US and Europe and that's probably going to happen across the world as well. Okay, so. I hope this is useful. Again, uh, I'm not a real expert in this area, but I think I'm translating the main messages well because I work hard on doing that. So if there is any issue, you can let me know, right? Okay, so what's the next topic? Next topic is going to be, I've saved all these things and I looked there. Uh, so there is something called science-based targets fail. Maybe I'll look at that, but maybe I won't. Okay, see you in the next podcast.